All right. Well, we'll get things rolling. We'll continue to admit people as they come in and you'll have to forgive my uh, hairdo. It is several months into quarantine and it's showing. Um, so I didn't make myself as Zoom ready as I needed to be. Uh, and I should have taken some more notes during our May virtual event. Uh, but I'm Garrett Brown. I'm incoming president for SEMPDX. And I'd like to thank everyone for joining us today uh, and taking an hour out of your day for a great presentation by Eli Schwartz. Uh, but before we go, just a couple of house cleaning items. Um, we are proud to announce that we are still holding a virtual engage event in August of this year. Uh, the board and myself are finalizing speakers, sponsors, um, and kind of the hosting platform. We will have communications out to everyone uh, still registered or someone who, uh, or anyone who would like to register for that uh, in the upcoming <clears throat> weeks and months. Uh, we will work to get that out just as soon as we can. Uh, and we're really excited about that. And we know that um, given everything that's going on, uh, we wanted to make sure that we could at least get as many people uh, you know, in front of speakers in the best way we know how. Uh, and so more details on that coming soon, but it is still scheduled for uh, the 6th and 7th of August of this year. Um, <clears throat> speaking of which, uh, the board, uh, we do have an open position for our sponsorship director. Uh, anyone who is interested in joining our board, it is a vital role. It helps us in so many different uh, weekly and monthly events to helping us out with Engage. It's a great way of joining the board. Uh, we really are needing our help more now than ever. Um, so if you're interested in joining our board, the application is open on our website. Uh, we should have a link there and we'll also put a link in the chat to that sponsorship open position. Uh, but we really invite everyone to join us. We are a fun bunch, if I do not say so myself. Um, we will be continuing to have virtual events now into the eventual future. Uh, we do know that things are tending to reopen, but uh, we believe that large uh, events, uh, networkings and kind of events will still be kind of months out. We'll continue to work and, uh, and educate ourselves on uh, health policies, both at the county level and the state level. Uh, but for now, we will continue to roll out virtual events such as this, uh, and we'll be announcing those uh, in the coming months. Um, and, um, you know, it, we are still open for memberships as well as sponsorships for our virtual uh, Engage event. If you're interested at all, just go to our website, fill out the contact form, uh, and someone will get right back to you. But with that, I'm going to hand it over to Eli Schwartz. Um, Eli joins us uh, for his uh, presentation on SEO, and we're really excited to have him. And again, thank you for everyone for joining. Uh, and with that, I'll hand it over to Eli. So hey, everyone. My name is Eli. Uh, joining you from the Bay Area. Huge fan of Portland. Really honored to be participating in this. And, uh, Todd had asked me to come up to Portland, and I was excited to actually physically come up. So. Uh, this will have to do. So the presentation I, I'm giving today is uh, one I have not yet given at any conference. So if you have any feedback, find me on LinkedIn. My email address is here. I'm happy to, to take any sort of brutal feedback to anything. Just reach out. Let me know if something's unclear or uh, you completely disagree with anything I said. So what we're going to talk about today is a way of doing SEO that is different then most people are going to do SEO and we're not going to follow the typical herd and, and just kind of chase after what everyone is chasing after. Now, when you, most people, when you think of SEO, these are the kinds of things that come to mind. Didn't have a chance to meet any of you. If I was, you know, if this was in person, I'd probably know a few of you and have a chance to talk and find out who's here. So uh, everyone's anonymous, which is kind of on my screen. But typically when people talk about SEO and I have a lot of conversations on SEO, these are the things that typically come to mind. So people think of SEO as algorithmic updates. So they're like, well, you know, these are non SEO people or SEO people themselves. It's a constant game of cat and mouse with Google. And it's all about you do something until an algorithm update happens. And that's whether we're in the SEO field or not. People not in the SEO field, I've met many people who are like, oh, I did really, I did really well on Google. And then they kind of slap me down. The other thing people think of is they like to think of, of uh, SEO traffic as free. So it's the opposite side of the coin from paid traffic. This is search, but it's free search. Next is it's all about rankings. So whether you're in SEO, whether you're out of SEO, there are always people that are going to think of SEO as it's all about ranking. It's, it's your, if you're not on that first page, if you're not in that first slot, 
you're nobody and you're completely wasting your time. And the final thing that I think we can all agree in SEO or out of SEO that people think of when it comes to SEO is that there's some sort of snake oil involved and there's magic either because we're doing it and we don't want to share the magic with other people or there's magic in that you have been a victim of someone selling you SEO and it has not worked out because they overpromised. Now, I think these are absolutely the wrong targets when we think of SEO. Any, all those four ideas, if that's the way you think of SEO, if that's what anybody thinks of SEO, that's completely missing the mark. And I'm taking that from the experience that I've worked on uh, with a number of really cool companies. Most of the work I do, so I spend a number of years at SurveyMonkey, but most of the work I do is with large scalable companies that have the ability to do SEO, but not do it in a very quick way and do it in a very scalable way and they're able to win. So these are the lessons that I've sort of uh, coalesced around and want to share that with you. So first of all, when we think of the way everyone does SEO, let's think of whether it works logically. So most people, when they talk about how they're doing SEO, they're thinking of Google as it was, and this is a screenshot of Google, their very first uh, homepage about 21 years ago. So they think of SEO as the way Google was when it first started, Google was started to index the web and people are trying to game that index of the web. Now, we all know that a lot has changed in technology. Google is a very, very, very different company now. And they're using a lot of different technology to figure out what it is that users want, what it is that the uh, times want. So I think search results change by the time, what it is that websites are trying to articulate and how to really create the best experience for people. But if, as you hear people talk about SEO, they're really talking about that same engine. The SEO advice you would have read on a blog 15 years ago is not really much changed from the SEO advice that you hear nowadays. And we'll walk through some of that and see if that's applicable. But first, I wanna share with you something that is uh, a little bit embarrassing of a habit I've had. So I live in the Bay Area, and up until we were all stuck in our houses, there was uh, many, many self-driving cars traveling around the streets around my house. Now, my bad habit is every time I'd see one of these cars, I want to see how good the technology was. So what I would do is I would, on my bike or on foot, I, or even in my car, I would start heading towards the car to see what would happen. Now, if everything works out, then the car stops and I get to learn how this AI is working. If it doesn't work out, I figure I'll get to sign an NDA and uh, they'll you know, continue the reputation of that these self-driving cars never hit anybody. Now, this particular car that I was riding my bike towards is Waymo. So um, many times when I talk about Waymo in public presentations, I typically ask people if they've heard of Waymo. Even in search crowds, very, very few hands go up. So I'll assume that many people here have not heard of Waymo. Waymo is a division of Alphabet, which is Google, and it is their self-driving car division. So this is a, a, I think it's been around for 10 years. So Waymo has driven more autonomous miles than any other car company that is working on autonomous, autonomous driving challenges. So more than Chrysler, more than GM who bought Cruz, certainly more than Uber, Waymo is using artificial intelligence to decide whether a thing crossing its path is a person, or in my case, a suicidal biker, or whether it is just a bug and it can keep going because they're using radar and they, you know, things might look the same and they're making decisions that are really life and death decisions. Now, Google is an AI company and this kind of AI that can save or not kill people is working in the very same company that is trying to help understand what it is that users are looking for when they type search results in. So let's keep that in mind. Now, as we think about Google as an AI company, and we think about the typical best practices we use, they seem kind of dumb. You know when you're doing SEO, you wanna put keywords in your title tag, great. Does it matter what word it is that we put in our title tag, whether it's plural, whether it's a synonym, when you have an AI company approaching this, this solution? Thousand words of copy, this is again common advice. You know, that'll, how many words you actually have to have in a piece of copy is when getting you have SEO best practices, they'll tell you how many words. So does that matter again when Google's approaching this from an AI standpoint, a clickable title, you're trying to game the clickable system when they're actually using AI to see what people are clicking. And I know a lot of times people will talk about whether, use it, whether Google uses 
engagement data on whether that goes in the algorithm. So if you keep in mind that Google is an AI company, we're actually training their algorithms. We're training their AI. So maybe they're not going to shift our exact rankings. But the same way when you fill out a caption, you tell them which is a traffic light, you're training them on recognizing traffic lights. When you click a result that maybe has the word free bolded in it, they will know that people gravitate towards free bolded it. Same goes with a powerful snippet. So yes, the meta description does not count as a part of the algorithm because they aren't processing it as a part of the page. But again, from an AI standpoint, certainly writing the best snippet and not gaming it, they're going to know whether people click it or not. And finally, when it comes to images, there's, again, all this advice around whether you want to put an alt tag, what kind of images to use. Google has a, a tool on all Android phones called Google Lens, which actually can recognize, physically recognize what pictures are. So if you take a picture of something, I use it all the time when I find scary bugs on my house. You take a picture of something, it can tell you exactly what that is. So Google's an AI company, and when you approach it with these SEO best practices, it seems like a bit of a waste of time. Site speed. So again, everyone will get really obsessed by this metric of site speed. Again, Google is far smarter than the, the site speed is just a raw score. I've worked with a company that was in the rental car space. They were competing with enterprise.com. Enterprise.com had a score of one. So one to 100, one is the worst. And yet enterprise.com still was able to get plenty of search traffic. So again, I don't think that when it comes to an intelligent search engine, it really matters specifically what the score is. Obviously, if you have a bad experience for users, that would be a problem. Now, this is my favorite. When you think about links, this is just a screen grab of the links, the messages I get every day in my inbox. Google gets these two, and when Google's an AI engine, they also know that a link is gamed. If IBM.com is a, is a company, it's an enterprise company that creates enterprise hardware and there's a random link to a Bitcoin site in some deep blog, they don't need to know that the link sphere is kind of is fake. That's obvious, right? It's an anomaly that their AI will identify. And they don't need to penalize anybody. It just doesn't work in the algorithm. Now, if you think about all of SEO from a logical standpoint, you would think that if you do all the right things, you have the right site speed, you have all the right keywords, you have all the right uh, links, if you do that, you go up in the search results. If you don't, you go down, and it's just sort of this constant seesaw effect. Now, if Google is an AI engine, this cannot possibly be true. Now, let's move over to the practical. So if we're doing SEO like everyone else is always doing SEO, let's think of whether this process even works. So I'll take a hypothetical job site. So we're doing SEO for a job listing. So let's, this is Craigslist, but let's say we're doing SEO for Indeed or any other you know, job listings website. We're gonna start with doing keyword research. Now, I'm not typically a big fan of keyword research because we're going to find words that anybody with a subscription, I'm, in this case, I'm using Rank Ranger, I'm a big fan of Rank Ranger. Anybody that has enough money for a subscription to a keyword tool can find these exact keywords and find this exact volume and see the competition and see the difficulty score. And we will all in this entire SEO industry and entire content industry, even more digital marketing are gonna to gravitate towards what these keyword tools that we only pay, let's say $99 a month will tell us to do. But moving on from that, we take that keyword, we come up with an idea of like, let's do how to apply for unemployment, let's search for that exact term. I'm doing an in-title search. Look how many results there are that have done the exact same thing. They've also gone onto the keyword tool. They've also figured out that these are the things to do. And now we're competing against every single one of these. But we're going to be smarter. We're going to find all the exact same backlinks that those winning sites had, and we're going to get more and of those backlinks, and we're going to do even better. But guess what? Everyone else in the SEO industry is doing the exact same thing. So it's this entire, entire game of playing cat and mouse, both with other SEOs and, and with Google, of just trying to get one step ahead. And then finally, we're going to cap this all off by tracking our rankings. I think rankings are the biggest waste of time you could ever do. I think rankings are not a KPI. I've uh, worked in many companies and consulted for many companies where they're obsessed with rankings. Rankings don't equal revenue, and we'll talk a little bit about revenue in a bit. They are just a vanity metric. And so you know, many times you have this rankings dashboard and you say, I'm ranking number one on this really long term that nobody searches for, doesn't really do anything. But when we do all of this process of Let's do our keyword research. Let's write this content. The only way we can really cover how well we're doing is by showing a rankings report to prove that all of that worked out. 
But when you think about this, your ability to create more traffic and to rank on more content, if that's your KPI, is completely limited by the capacity of what you can write. So if you have budget for 10 pieces of content per month, then you will only have 120 pieces of content per year. That's all you can do. Stuff as many keywords in that content as possible, but that is all you can do. So if that is your approach, I'm going to find good keywords and write good content, whatever your budget is, you're completely capped. But I don't think those are really the biggest problems with this approach at all. Biggest problem is Google's an AI engine. So if you're doing all the right things, you've got the right content, you have the right keywords, you have the right links, you may still not get that ranking. So you're going after this ranking, you've told yourself, you've told your boss, you've told whoever it is, your client, that your goal is to rank on a certain word. You're doing all the right things. It may not happen. Now, I've been doing SEO for a really long time, and in some cases, I see that sites are ranking on keywords that they do not use on the site at all, and they're ranking in high positions. In some cases, I see that sites are ranking on keywords that they do use, had links, but lost them years ago, and they can't shank the rankings. In some cases, I see sites that are visibly penalized by Google, but are still able to rank on keywords. What this tells me is that the metrics that we think we use, and you know, there'll always be a number of blog posts about these are the factors that go into Google's algorithm. You can get all of those right. You can be better than all your competitors and you may still not get to the other side of the rainbow like you're trying to get there. But that's not all. Even if you do get that desired ranking, so say you rank on the word unemployment, like I showed we were going through that path. You rank on that word unemployment, but you're a job website. You want people who want to apply for jobs. That's how you get paid, but you rank on unemployment and all they want to do is how to get free, gov free money from the government so they could not have a job. So you're number one, congratulations, but that doesn't do anything at all for your business because you're focusing on the wrong metric. And finally, when, and this is assuming you do actually get that ranking, you rank on that word unemployment, but you miss out on a different word because you're so focused on this rankings report and sharing out that rankings report that you miss out that there's another keyword that's even better that's driving more money that you should be more proud of because that's not what you're tracking. You're tracking rankings towards a specific keyword. And this is an example of that. So this is on my own website. Say I was tracking how I ranked on the word international SEO and that was all I was tracking. I might miss out and I don't, it, it, Forgive me here, I don't rank on any of these keywords. But say I was looking to see how I ranked on international SEO and I ranked number five, I might miss out that I ranked on international SEO consultant at number one. And again, I do not, right? So like when I'm able to look at all the keywords I'm, I am generating traffic on, it is so much more important to actually look at the entire forest rather than any specific trees. So that brings me to the way I like to approach SEO, which is I call it product-led SEO. And just to be clear, this is a term I potentially coined. I haven't seen anybody else use it, but it is not a concept at all that I have come up with. I'm also uh, in the process of, of writing a book by this title. So please email me and, and I can send you an early copy when it's done. It's, it's close to being done. Love any feedback on it. So I'm going to talk to you about product-led SEO, which is really throwing out all these other ways of doing SEO, which is kind of trying to game against Google's algorithm or chasing after keywords just like everyone else is chasing. We're going to completely flip this and we're going to reverse the funnel. Instead of going after the, basically the keyword that drives towards a conversion, we're going to start with the conversion. We're going to try to understand what it is that makes people convert. How do we create a great experience? How do we create the content that people want to read and dial that back to the content we need to create? So rather, again, rather than starting with a keyword and looking at search volume and building in content and hoping that people are going to read that, key, that content, which has that keyword in it and search it, it's going to achieve the metrics. And I can't tell you how many times I've participated in this process of forecasting SEO, which again starts with, here's how many people search per month. Here's my anticipated click-through rate. Here's my anticipated conversion rate. Here's my anticipated the revenue amount and here's all the money I'm going to generate from SEO. I want to completely reverse that and say, here's how much, here's what people really want and base that on talking to actual people. So if I have a product and we can stick with a jobs product, hopefully the job market will continue to expand. I have a product. I know I have an innovation in the job space. 
So rather than going after keywords and doing keyword research in the job space, or another way of doing keyword research I didn't mention earlier, which is obviously following the herd, is to look at your competitors. So say I'm competing with Indeed, to go look at what Indeed is ranking on. I'm competing with Craigslist, look at what Craigslist is ranking on. Forget that. Let's go, let's use a survey. Let's talk to people. And this doesn't have, have to be an actual survey. I spent a number of years at SurveyMonkey. You don't actually have to write an actual survey. This could be a list of questions that you put in a Google form. Could be a list of questions you talk to a potential customer on the street. Could be a list of questions that you ask your family about. But really it's starting with people and saying, what's broken with what you're looking for now? Where is indeed missing the target? What is it that my innovation can do better? Now that's if you're early on. If you are a little bit later on in your process, you should have some customer data. You should be able to look at your pages and say, where are people dropping off? Where is, uh, when I talk to customers, again, if you have a sales team, when I talk to customers, where is it that people are ending up with competitors because something else is better and my solution didn't achieve that mark? And we're going to create content for all of these things. And finally, if your company is a little bit larger, find out from customer support what people are missing. What are the questions they're asking that they could have just answered for themselves online if you just had that content? And in all of this, we're going to think conversion, not search volume. So too often when we're building out the models of how we're going to do SEO, again, we're starting with here's how many people are searching per month. Let's forget all of that. Let's go after what's the content that people are likely going to convert on. Now, if I think about one obvious piece of content that people are likely going to convert on, if you're competing against Indeed in the job space, you might let's invent a hypothetical name right now. So it, it will call it SEMPDX jobs. If you are, if someone is searching for Indeed versus SEMPDX jobs, very likely they're at the bottom of the funnel. The conversion rate on that, provided you can answer the question that the user was looking for, will be so much higher than if you just tried to rank on a big search volume term that everyone else is trying to rank on. And on that, if you think about it, I would rather go after something that has very low search volume we'll have incredibly high click-through rate and we'll have a even higher conversion rate. Rather than something that has thousands of clicks of searches per month, I'll have a very low click-through rate and of course I'll have a very low conversion rate. And for those of you that aren't doing the math here, this is three versus one. So when I'm looking at keywords, I'm looking at the keywords and yes, I will do some keyword research, but I, I'll do keyword research and base it on keywords that have the highest likelihood of conversion, have the best fit I can easily write content towards what that user is looking for, what the intent of that user might be, rather than a keyword that has a ton of search volume, so then I can blow up my search console, which is, happens to be my favorite reporting tool, but blow up my search console and say, look how much traffic I'm getting, look at all the keywords I'm ranking on. Let's measure that by dollars and actual conversions. Now to do this, I like to do something called Blue Ocean SEO. So Blue Ocean Strategies, is a very interesting business book. Recommend everyone read it. Uh, can't pronounce the name of the authors, but do Google it. Now, this is an idea of you're going after something that not everyone else is going after. So if you think about it, a good example they had in this book is if you were creating a new taxi service. So there, you're in New York and there already are taxis and you create a brand new taxi service. The only way you're going to compete on taxis is if you have cheaper prices or some sort of other feature. You have, um, you're faster, your cars are more clean. But then you look at what Uber did or Lyft, whoever came first, and they blow up the entire model. And they said, we're not competing on taxis. We've created something completely different. They've created demand out of thin air. Now, I like to do the same thing for SEO. So rather than saying, I'm going to look at keywords, which implies that someone has already searched on those keywords, which implies that a website is already ranking on it, I'd like to understand from my users what is missing and create that brand new content create the demand for myself. And this may be a little bit pie in the sky right now, but I'm going to explain in a second about how some other sites have done this and it'll make a lot more sense. But again, rather than focusing on keywords and the kinds of content that everyone else has already created and trying to do better and beat them at their own game, let's just go completely different and go to what's Blue Ocean. Again, strongly recommend everyone read this book. And then as we scale, so we've created more content towards what we know people already want. We're gonna scale this SEO with providing a better experience because as we have this great product, 
and people are coming in, we'll know again what more gaps are, what the utilities are they're missing. So now there's some other feature that they need content on, some other questions they have, rather than saying, I'm gonna continue growing my SEO because I have this really long keyword list, I have thousands of keywords, and I'm just gonna keep checking keywords off my list until I'm done. And then I'll revisit the tool and see if there's other keywords I missed. Instead, our entire content roadmap will based, be based on what are the things that we need to go after because our users are looking for it and they will convert. And when we prioritize this list based on conversion rather than search volume. And as we do this, again, this is still pie in the sky, but we're about to get to how this all works. We're gonna aim for what I call programmatic, which is we're not creating actual content, we're creating pieces of, and this is an engineering part, and I'll admit that this, there is a big engineering lift and most of the clients that work with it, this has to be done by engineering, but we're creating pages that provide value to users and it doesn't necessarily require that we write out a bunch of content. This might make sense for e-commerce. This might make sense if you're uh, curating content. And next I wanna think about something that's scalable. So if there's something that's programmatic and there's something that scales for users, but there's only 10 potential ideas, that might not be where I wanna focus. But if there's a thousand potential ideas, that might be where there's more potential traffic. So within, these, within what I'm focusing on, there should be higher conversion and better fit for users. And then finally, before we get to the examples, as we do this, we have to have an open mind to always learn what it is that's working. So we wanna be, we create these pages, we see what the users are searching for. If it answers the user's questions, we create more of it. If it doesn't answer the user's questions, our eyes are open to know that that's happening and to go into another direction. And again, we're not using a guide of, how's, here's how much traffic I'm getting. Our guide is, here's how much my SEO is satisfying what the users are looking for. And then finally, when you do this, you, when you own it, you will own it forever. So you think about like when Amazon and Amazon's gonna be one of the examples I'm gonna talk about. When Amazon built out their structure to win on SEO, they had no idea that in the year 2020, surgical gloves and surgical masks would be the most popular item anybody could, pop, could possibly search for online, oh, aside from all the other toilet paper and, and generators and pools and bikes and that we needed for the pandemic. But they didn't target surgical gloves. They didn't use search volume to say, we need to make sure we rank on surgical gloves. They built an amazing product. They focused on the SEO from a high level, from an engineering standpoint, from a product standpoint, and they were able to win it and keep this when the volume was created. And say it's one day some other product becomes legal or popular, they're gonna be in the exact same place because they're not focusing on individual keywords. They're focusing on an entire idea of winning at SEO by providing a great crawlable experience, by creating a great content experience and creating a, a excellent searchable site. And now we'll talk about the case studies. So keeping in mind everything I've said before about Blue Ocean, about always learning, about winning and owning it forever, these are prime examples of sites that do this. So I talked about Amazon a little bit, so they rank on surgical gloves. Now think about TripAdvisor. If TripAdvisor was created today, you were building out a TripAdvisor, you would probably do something like, let me find the most popular hotel in Portland, and I'm gonna write a thousand word blog post. Let me find the most popular hotel in New York, let me write a thousand word blog post. Instead, TripAdvisor said, how is it that we can have traffic and create a great content experience on every single property in the entire country first, and then the entire world? And I guarantee you, if TripAdvisor's still around, and we hope they, they continue to survive, but if one day we colonize Mars, and there are hotels in Mars, TripAdvisor, all they have to do is have a new category structure called universe and then add in Mars and divide up all the countries and states that are Mars and their site will be well optimized. Whereas other people would be cashing up and having to build that architecture. My favorite example of all of these is Zillow. So Zillow did, they obviously rank on some great keywords, but what Zillow generates most of their traffic on is our addresses. So if they were building out a site for SEO, there was no search volume. This is the absolute blue ocean. Zillow said, we're not going to try to rank on real estate keywords like mortgage loan or buy a house or sell a house. They said, there is no, no solution right now for every single address in the United States, except for Google Maps or MapQuest. We're gonna create that. We're gonna build SEO off of that. And look, everyone else that wants to do it is copying them. And they've made themselves the verb. Let's go, let's Zillow it. Or they, they're the, you know, number one position for every single address, and that's where they're driving all their traffic in. This is the absolute blue ocean. 
to make it more clear, I'll talk about some case studies from my own work. So worked with a company called Drops. So this is a, a translation app, primarily on phones. They want to build out a website. They, if you think about translation, they're competing against every single dictionary that's ever existed. And they're also competing against Google Translate. So rather than build a site that focused on, let's build out this dictionary, we focused on creating a great crawlable experience, creating content that we knew people wanted based on the app. And then some of it we win, some of it we don't. And this is the result. Over a year, they went from zero to generating 140 million impressions and 1.6 million clicks. This is not about what keyword are we going to track or ranking on the word bread in German. It's we're going to build out pages and phrases for every single thing. We're going to make sure this is organized from an engineering standpoint, from an architecture standpoint, and what will generate traffic will generate traffic. And it's amazing the kinds of words that other dictionary apps and websites did not fill in the gap. And that's where we're able to fill in the gap. Because again, we didn't focus on the keyword volume. We focused on the great experience for users. And regardless how you come in, it's very easy to navigate the site. Another example is an app called Fishbowl. So Fishbowl, for anybody that's familiar with uh, sites like uh, Blind or earlier as Glassdoor, this is reviews and, and chat about consulting agencies. So same idea. It was an app. People were talking about different topics. Rather than say, we want to rank on this individual keyword, we want to rank on Deloitte or PwC, we created a great crawlable experience that what generates traffic generates traffic. What doesn't? will eventually generate traffic. And when things become popular, like there are suddenly layoffs, there is a ton of traffic to be had because we've built the architecture, we've built the experience and didn't go after keywords. And finally, this is one of my favorite examples, be just because of the sheer amount of cl uh, clicks they've generated. This was a site, they had millions and millions of potential users that were asking them questions. What we did was we exposed all of those questions and that those questions turned into great content. So it wasn't, we're going to go after the biggest keywords in the space is really, we're going to go after the content we already had. And by just putting it out there, it matched with other things that other people needed to know. And as you can see, the traffic is there. So now just to wrap up, we'll talk about some specific tactics you can take away from this and ideally think about product led SEO. But if you can't, these are some things I would love for you to do anyways. So first of all, brand versus non-brand. Typically when we're doing SEO or you know, someone's doing SEO for you, they're focused on non-brand. It doesn't really matter because if you're focusing on conversion, try to convert on branded keywords because that's dollars. If you're in a position where you are a consultant, generate more branded clicks for your clients, they'll be happy. If you're in a position where you're working in-house, generate more branded clicks for your boss, they'll be very happy. If you're working for yourself and you generate more branded clicks and turns into more dollars, it doesn't really matter. So why focus on brand versus non-brand? Just focus on where you can convert the highest. Now, before you get started on that, it's very important to look at your, your search console and look at your metrics on what your brand versus non-brand percentage is. When I first joined SurveyMonkey, uh, we had analytics back in the day before Google took all that away, so I knew the keywords. But we were at about 90% brand. By the time I left, we were down to about 40% brand. Many times, and that's where I think the ideal brand versus non-brand split should be. So your brand will grow as high as your brand will grow. Non-brand will grow infinity. But know this number. So figure out where your opportunities are doing based on your non-brand versus brand split from Google Search Console. Next is build Q&A. So like I said, that site that built out Q&A, they were able to grow tremendously. So if you already have these questions coming in, if they're already in your database, if you know people are already asking them, this isn't about going after schema. It's a popular thing to build schema for FAQs and to Q&A. This is really about creating content that you know people just need to know and that the answers are not available for them elsewhere. And just think about as you go through your day, how many questions you have that you just try to answer for yourself, but you can't. Imagine if you could participate in creating that content, creating those answers for people how much search volume and how much you'll satisfy users there could potentially be. Next is search suggestions. So again, rather than go after keyword search volume, whatever it is that I'm going after, and this is an example with Zoom, let's look at the search suggestions and make sure I have a piece of content for all of those suggested queries because someone's looking for it. And if they don't find you, and especially if this is your brand, if they don't find you, they're going to find someone else. So again, we're not going after what has the highest search volume. We're going after what users just need to know. 
So if we create this for them, they'll find us. I mentioned this a little bit earlier, but look at your search query reports. This is in Search Console. Look at the kinds of things that people are looking for and make sure that you satisfy what they want. And if you don't, create new content for it. And even more than that, look at the, what they're looking for and what you've created for them and figure out ideas of what else you need to create. So you may not have intended on targeting on something, and this is an example of a site that was targeting just a list of languages. And look at all the things that people want to know around Asian languages. There are opportunities here because of the sheer amount of search volume and just making sure that people get the answers they want. So again, we're not going after, this is how, much, how many searches there are I, I see in my keyword tool. This is how many searches and impressions I see on my very own website and I need to make sure that I have the right content for people. And finally, this is like the, you know, the, my favorite advice on links. Instead of going after links, most of which Google can tell are probably manipulated, go after PR, but just make sure the PR has the link in it. So if someone is talking about you and it, people will potentially click on that, that's far more valuable than any link you think has a number of domain authority or this amount of do follow. If people are clicking, you're generating traffic to yourself, you can potentially generate conversions. If it helps your SEO, that's great. I can't tell you how many sites and pages I've seen that rank really well that have zero links. So don't get bogged down by chasing after metrics that may or may not work, go after PR. I, I've worked with some amazing agencies that are really, really good at PR, really understand how it is that generating awareness will eventually turn into SEO. So if I can help there, please reach out. But again, focus on people talking about you, people clicking over your website rather than anything like domain authority. Now, as I do this, I keep everything organized. I call this product-led SEO. I firmly believe that SEO should be managed as a product. So therefore I have my own SEO project management sheet because this is what product managers do. So I have an SEO version. Happy to share this with you if you ping me. My email address was in the beginning and at the end. Um, check out my website, elishwartz.co, and happy to share this. Now, just to wrap up, in case you missed anything I'm saying, this is the very quick recap. You can't fool Google. Google's AI, there's no chance that we're ever going to be smarter than Google and their AI in a long term. You may find a loophole based on here's the link I can get, I can get a bunch of traffic, but that can't last because Google is AI, which means artificial intelligence, and they're constantly getting smarter. Focus on generating conversions and the ultimate end goal of anything you're trying to get with traffic and not on just getting rankings. So your final KPI should be conversions. Many times that I work with larger companies, they can't figure it out. Their attribution is too complicated. So get some sort of closer metric. Here's how much traffic I'm getting on a page that likely converts. Here's how many people are signing up for a webinar and then the salespeople talk to them. But focus on an end goal that is not just rankings and what your position is. And finally, think as big as possible. Don't say, my goal for this year is to rank on X amount of keywords. Say my goal for this year is to generate millions of impressions and, and thousands of clicks. And no matter what space you're in, there's content and there are things that you can do to help out users. One of the hardest things I have when I work with anyone is on SaaS. So SaaS, for those that aren't know, it, know it's, it's the, uh, software as a service. And when you think about it, you have a software, it's really just a tool. And there's only so many ways you can talk about the tool. So for example, SurveyMonkey SaaS, Survey Monkey is just a survey. So how many ways am I going to generate traffic off of survey, right? Online survey, and then it sort of tails off there. But if you think about the kind of things you can satisfy people with, with data, with content, there's so many more ways to really go much higher in the funnel and generate search traffic that people are going to want to experience your product with. It's not about how what I'm ranking on and I'm ranking on the most important keyword in my space. It's how many potential users can I touch? How many people will get introduced to my product? There's always a way to generate more traffic and, and then from there generate more conversions. So that's my approach. Again, I please, please give me feedback on any of this. Love to know if uh, this didn't make sense to you at all. This made a ton of sense. If I can help you with it or I can help you with anything at all. So thank you very much. Thank you, Eli.
Uh, we'll be sure to send out a copy of this deck out to everyone so you can have the contact information uh, you see in front of you. Uh, but with that, if Eli, we have about 15 minutes, a little less than 15 minutes remaining on our hour today. I was hoping to open it up to the Q&A with the audience. Uh, and so with that, if you open up your participant screen uh, and use the raise hand, we will can call on you if you have any questions for Eli. All right, uh, Gigi, you're up. Hey, hi, this is Gigi Rosenberg. So I had a couple questions. One was, when you're talking about content, is a thousand word blog post really the only uh, or the best form of content? And the reason I'm asking is I'm a public speaking coach and what I'd like to create are little short videos that are about one specific topic and I've gotten a lot of views on them. You know, what I'll do is then I'll post the video on my blog with then a transcript or a summary of like the tip. Content is answering the user's question. So that's why I, I dislike anything that is a defined metric, like you need a thousand words. It could be that you need Q&A and you really just need to answer. Like think about how much Reddit ranks on search. Reddit is not a thousand words, many cases, right? It's just a, a, uh, just a short sentence. Or if you're e-commerce, and this is a you know, big mistake I see many e-commerce websites do, not Amazon, of course, but many other e-commerce websites, they think they need to achieve some sort of keyword metric on the descriptions of the product. Say you're talking about a sun umbrella, like how many ways are you going to describe a sun umbrella like that matter for users? So they waste so much time trying to jam in some keywords like it's a sun umbrella, it protects you from the big ball of hot thing in the sky. Like none of that matters. It matters it's a sun umbrella. There's the color, this is the size and that's it. So there's no hard and fast rule about content. It's exactly what human users need and anything else is probably a waste of time in my opinion. Great. Thank you. Thank you, Gigi. Up next, Alex. Hey, how's it going, Eli? Um, you mentioned that in uh, the work with Drops that you had discovered some gaps in, uh, in like definitions or something along those lines that other online dictionaries hadn't serviced. Uh, can you provide a few examples of just kind of like the types of things that you found? So I didn't identify gaps. Google identified the gaps. So that's the that's value in this is that we created a really good Check out the page, check out the site, it's languagedrops.com. We created a really good architecture, a really good experience for users, but then some things like uh, Babel or dictionary.com or whatever the, the translation sites will rank on, but then there were others where there was just no content for it. I think uh, Hawaiian was <laughs> something that we generated a lot of content for, so we put as much effort in Hawaiian as we did for German, but the Hawaiian took off because none of the other sites, who knows people want to speak Hawaiian, but none of the other sites had that. So Google identified that here, Drops was a great fit, and they slotted us in. And it, had we gone after search volume, we would have said, well, more people in the world speak Spanish, or more people in the word, world speak Arabic, let's forget about Hawaiian, which I don't know that anybody actually speaks as a primary language, and like leave it at that. Another one we, we got was uh, Tagalog, which is what they speak in the Philippines. There were a number of gaps there, and Google identified the gaps because, again, we had a great site, some of the things and phrases that we had were better than some of the things that other sites had. So that's where I'd focus again on building out a, the drops is a great example of a site that's programmatic. Uh, I'm sorry, I didn't explain that more. Programmatic meaning we put all the effort into building out structure. And then as you launch it, you don't actually say, here's how I'm gonna optimize this page. You just launch the whole thing. And of course it's scalable because as you launch one language, you can scale into every word in that language. And of course scale into every word in every other language too. Great. We have a we have a couple of questions from the chat box. One from Felix here. Uh, question: Following the uh, creating of new funnels from scratch, do you see voice as a new vector of emerging traffic? I love this question. So, uh, I, and I, I have a strong opinions about voice, which is <laughs> I don't think that we will ever see voice as the primary source of search traffic, simply because what Google does, and think about this from a Okay, take one step back. We're all marketers. What Google does when you ask Google a question, Google says, well, I have 10 possible answers for you. Choose the one you like the best. That's, that's search results. Sometimes Google says, you know what? 10 is too much. I have seven possible results for you. Choose the one that looks best. Now, 
when you do voice search, Google has to be able to answer exactly what you want. And that I think is a challenge that Google may not be smart enough in our lifetimes to do. Could be wrong, but I, I think that's a very hard thing to know exactly what each person wants in their head. Now from a, from a search standpoint, I, I saw Felix just clarify the question. From a search standpoint, voice is just is what transliterates. So voice is taking the words that you said and then it just writes it out and looks for the same thing as the database. Then what makes voice more interesting is you give Google more clues about what you want. So this is my favorite part of voice, which is Google is trying to be a specific search engine. They want to give you exactly what you want based on what they know about you. So when you do voice and you do a longer query, you're actually helping them know more. So think about like um, weather. When you say the word weather, if I'm in the Bay Area, I say the word weather, it tells me my weather. You guys say weather, it tells you the weather for, for Portland. They knew my location, they knew what I wanted. Now, when you say, uh, what's the weather this weekend, they will try to, they could even incorporate information like where are you going to be this weekend. So the longer, more you say, the more they know, and the more specific that result gets, which means that going after search volume, if all I wanted to do was rank on weather, no one's going to search that specific term because the Google's appending location and data to that query anymore. More people search something specific. Absolutely. Thank you for that. Uh, we have one from just uh, by the initials IH. Uh, do you approach search engine? Do you have a different approach to other search engines other than Google? Uh, say Bing, Yahoo, whatever else is remaining of the fragmented uh, uh, search space? No, because I think they're all trying to copy Google. I think, I think the only search engine that's absolutely different from Google is Baidu, but China is a whole different thing. DuckDuckGo is uh, mostly, I don't know if they do it anymore, but it used to be Yandex, which is very similar to Google, and mm -hmm. Google and Yandex have sued each other for infringing each other's patents. Bing, um, they're mostly similar to Google. So I'd approach Google with whatever percentage of the market they have. Uh, those of us that look at Google, uh, analytics assume that Google has about 90%. Those of us that believe in Comscore think that Google has 65%, but it probably is closer to 90. Yeah. Uh, any other questions, just use the raise hand feature within the participant screen. No? All right. Well, again, I, I, I know I speak for everyone, Eli, when I say thank you for joining us for our June event. Uh, this has been great. We had a lot of participants today. Uh, thank you, everyone, for joining us. We're going to, again, the board and myself are getting together and figuring out new ways of doing virtual events and just really providing as many member benefits and benefits to the digital marketing community here in Portland uh, the best way we know how. Uh, just as a reminder, uh, Engage virtual events will be coming up in August of this year. We'll have more information coming out very soon about that. And there is the sponsorship director position open on the SEM PDX board. Uh, so I invite anyone who's willing to look it forward to uh, submit. Uh, and with that, uh, again, I thank everyone for their time today and we'll give you back five minutes to your day.